<laughs> You're gonna make that this will be your most popular podcast when you talk like this. So this All is right. good. All even right. even keeping this part in, you and me talking about you being fearless, you should keep in. I'm telling you. What do you guys think? I don't know. We'll see. You don't know because this isn't live. Thank God. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kelsey Humphreys, and this is The Pursuit, where I help you in your journey, your hustle, and your climb to be your best self and put out your best work. After all, I'm still hustling for that too, guys. So I sit down and interview today's most successful celebrities, executives, and entrepreneurs, and I break down success for the rest of us. Let's dive into this episode with James Altucher. James Altucher is an entrepreneur, hedge fund manager, best-selling author, and podcaster. He has founded or co-founded more than 20 companies, including Reset Incorporated and Stockpicker.com, which have made him tens of millions of dollars. He is a prolific writer, and in 2010, he started his blog, has written multiple best-selling books, and writes for sites like The Financial Times, The Street, Thought Catalog, and The Huffington Post. Most recently, he is known for his wildly popular podcast, which have had over 12 million downloads. All right, thank you for joining me for another episode of The Pursuit. I am here with James Altucher, which is so cool. Uh, you have done so many things, and there's so much we can learn from you. And I like to start at the beginning. Uh, Wait, Kelsey, I'm going to interrupt. Okay. <laughs> First, I want to say, uh, and I apologize, I'm an interrupter, but Sorry. I want to say how grateful I am to, that you invited me on here. You have such an incredible roster of guests. I feel like I'm, I'm unworthy oh. to be on your show. But second, I want to just ask, like, out of all, I am a podcaster also. I want to know, after all these incredible guests, what's the biggest takeaway you've had? Like, what have you learned from doing this over the past year? You've been doing this for a year and three months now. Mm -hmm. What have you, what's the biggest takeaway? How has your life improved by doing this? Oh my gosh, my life has improved exponentially because before an interview, I spend hours researching and reading that person's content, and learning about their life. So it's not only did I bore you to tears? Did no, my bore he, you to tears? he's fascinating. You'll you guys will love him. But uh, so not only during the interview do I feel like I learn a lot, but just during prep. And so I mean, I feel like it's totally changed some of my mindsets and and helped me to relearn you know things that were taught from childhood. Like what? Uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot. Yes, he is putting me on the spot. Um, like what in your daily habits has, has changed? Okay, that's a better, easier question to answer. Daily habits, uh, I started a gratitude practice because you were going to ask like one of the biggest takeaways I think is probably gratitude. Now, not everyone talks about it specifically using that term, and they often call it different things or explain it different ways. But most of the time, these people who get to the top and stay there are incredibly grateful and they make it part of their day. I think this is a really important thing because so many people charge, oh, $15,000 for a class on entrepreneurship, <laughs> when really like one of the most important things is something you could do for free when you wake up in the morning, mm. which is just find four or five things to be grateful for. And not just easy things, like every day I could wake up and say, oh, I'm grateful for my kids or whatever, that's the easy stuff. But when you're in a difficult situation, which happens to all of us, no mm -hmm. matter who you are, like a difficult situation happens. You're you're in the middle of a business, it's a great business, but you learn your you you lose your biggest customer or you're a critical employee. How can you find in a or or your or a spouse leaves you yeah. or you lose money? How can you find in this difficult situation something to be grateful for? And I call that difficult gratitude problems. And I actually mm -hmm. go one step further in terms of a gratitude practice, which is every day try to solve a difficult gratitude problem. Because I think then you exercise mm -hmm. and you make this gratitude muscle sweat. And that actually makes you good at it, which has surprising benefits. Like no one thinks, oh, how can I be good at gratitude? It's actually really hard. And to, to mm -hmm. exercise, to make that muscle sweat is incredibly valuable. Glenn Beck called you an enigma. And I thought that that was really fitting because to look through your bio, there's so many different things. So if someone were to ask you, oh, James, what do you do? What's your answer? Are you a writer? Or are you a VC? Well, I don't like the question, what do you do? Because what do people do? We're human beings. We're not really supposed to. We're not like, you know, in an ant colony, everybody has their job. We're not an ant colony. Like our brains are slightly bigger than ants. So the question, what do we do? We do lots of things. Since since the age of 27, I've probably changed careers, not just jobs, but careers, 15 times. Wow. And people should feel like, I, I get a lot of emails, and I'm sure you do too, oh, I don't know what my passion is, what my pur pur purpose in life is. You know, so passion is something that you're 
profoundly interested in, a purpose is something you feel you could do to help other people. Well, those two things are going to change a lot. There's no such thing as having one passion, one purpose, mm. one pursuit. So I would say I write a lot. I invest a lot. I've started companies. I do podcasts. I, I do things that are totally off my bio where I help other people and, and help other companies succeed. And, and I, help my, I run my own companies. So I do lots of different things, and I have done lots of different things over the past 20, 25 years. Okay, so I'm going to put some creative constraints on you for this interview. Creative okay. constraints? I don't know if I can <laughs> handle that. Well, your four things, you know, that is yes. your answer to really where you are today and your success. I'm going to say you can't answer that until we get to it at the end. Okay. So try and maneuver around it because right. I know it's I like a that. huge part of your story, yes. but I don't want it to take over the interview because you've talked about it at length. So yeah. someone who's a fan of yours who watches your interviews has already They'll heard get bored. So it. we're going to move around that. So let's go back. Because at the beginning um, of the entrepreneurship journey, you've left HBO and you start this web development company because at the time you were the only person in New York who really understood HTML. There was probably like four or five people of, of us. Yeah. Yes. And they were probably more business sophisticated than I was. Mm. So they went out and did the smart thing. They raised money. They got clients and so on. I got clients. I never once raised money. So I actually made the mistake of having a profitable internet company, <laughs> which worked out well. But again, there was probably, like I said, four or five of us who really knew how to make you know, large-scale websites for big companies. So what do you think, going out on your own, that's what you know, a lot of people aspire to do, but most people will fail in the first few years out on their own. What do you think were the keys to the success of that first internet business you had? Well, um, I think it's really important all the time. I'm going to give a kind of a very specific answer and then a more broad, broad general answer. The general answer is more valuable, actually, because it's about habits that you can do today to create the foundation for that success. Because success doesn't come tomorrow. If you start a business today, it's not like you're selling it tomorrow or even a year from now for millions of dollars. You have to really build up to success. Mm -hmm. But let me just say the very first thing is people often think they have an idea and then the very next thing is they have their hand out and where's my venture capital money and I'm going to start a business. You don't really know what your business is when you have an idea. You, don't, you have to get customers, you have to get revenues, you have to get employees, you have to deliver a product, you have to service that product, you have to, you have to handle things when things go wrong. So, so it's, this, it's this ongoing nightmare, actually, that leads to success because things go wrong every single day mm. and you're stressed every single day. Um, but w most important thing, and this, again, this is the high-level specific advice and not kind of the more general habits, but always take care of risk. So people think, oh, I'm going to go out and be an entrepreneur. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to be like a cowboy and quit my job and start um, a food truck and delivering <laughs> meals for $5 to office workers. So, or I'm going to start the Uber for maids or whatever. That's, that's risky. Like just quitting your job and doing that without mm -hmm. knowing who your customers are, that's risky. So I was at HBO and uh, I, was, I knew how to build a website. American Express needed a website, AmericanExpress.com. Another person I knew needed a website, uh, it's now DiamondCutters.com. It was a diamond dealer on 47th Street. Another person I knew needed a website, Time Warner needed a website, TimeWarner.com. So gradually I was hearing from people who needed websites and they didn't know how to do it. I knew how to do it. So now there are other things today that people need that other people know how to do that others don't like. For instance, someone needs a virtual reality uh, environment some people know how to do it, some people don't. Like whatever annoys people, oh, I'm annoyed. I can't find somebody to do a VR experience for me. Well, there are people who know how to do it. Those are the entrepreneurs. So, but did I quit my job at HBO? Even when I did AmericanExpress.com and I got paid an enormous amount of money, did I leave my job at HBO? I was a low-level computer programmer at HBO and I got paid my annual salary at HBO. I got paid to do AmericanExpress.com. I did not leave my job because yeah. I was scared to death. Yeah. You leave your job, and even my boss at the time told me, you leave your job here, no one's returning your phone calls ever again. And it's true. When you work at like yeah. a big company, people return <laughs> your phone calls. If I say, hey, I'm calling from MTV, HBO, right. you know, Time Warner, everyone, nobody does not return your phone call. Mm -hmm. So I stayed at my full-time job for 18 months while building a company on the side. I had like a dozen employees and an office 20 blocks away from HBO and maybe a dozen clients before I finally, wow. 18 months later, quit my job at HBO, kept them as a client, by the way, and, <laughs> and went to be full-time at my own company where I was already the CEO. So it's, 
It's all about mitigating risk. Get customers, keep your salary to make sure you live, make sure you can pay your employees because you know now you maybe need less employees due to automation and outsourcing right. and so on. But at the time I had employees, make sure you can keep paying your employees, keep paying your rent. Don't be foolhardy and just rush into things. Like everything takes time. I probably was almost too conservative. I'm very risk averse. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the times when I've taken too much risk, I've lost on 100% of those gambles. So just take, take as little risk as possible. Now that's the specific advice. The less specific advice is invest in yourself. So all the time, the technology was changing. People think, oh, you know, that HTML stuff, that was easy. I wish I was around then. I would have been able to do it. Well, mm -hmm. it was not, it, 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 by the way, it was changing every day. So there was like Java, JavaScript, Flash, uh, all these things that don't exist now. There was how to <laughs> encode videos. Now it's all you upload to YouTube, but videos was very, and audio was very difficult then. Mm -hmm. Design was, nobody knew what good web design was, what good web interfaces were. So I had to constantly read. So that was one way I invested in myself. Hmm. Another way I invested in myself is I'm a shy and even introverted person. Like I don't like to be at a networking event. I like to just sit at home. And at that time I would sit at home and program. And so I had to invest in myself by going to networking events, learning how to meet people. I would call up my competitors. Like there were, again, like five or six companies in the space. I would call up my competitors and say, hey, can we meet for lunch? And we would share stories. Like that was the most valuable thing of all, to learn from the CEOs of my competitors. And I was the CEO of their competitor, yeah. me. And, um, or I would learn how to ask advice. I would call up the CTO of a, a major company and I would ask for advice like, hey, how, what do you need? How can I get your business? So these were very difficult things for me. I had to invest in myself to overcome my shyness and, and invest in myself to learn technology. And also, I wasn't a designer. I had to invest in myself to learn Photoshop and design and wow. so on and the techniques of design. And there were, there were books by, uh, you know, I forget his name, maybe Edward Tufte about um, data visualization and how to make it beautiful. And that's what the web is. It's basically data that you try to make beautiful, but it's not just beautiful. It also has to be workable and usable and, and functional. You know, form equals function equals design. So, uh, and I had to learn how to do sales. I had to invest myself to learn how to talk to people and learn how to how to sell my services. And not only that, nobody knew that they needed a website back then. I had to have a vision and convince people they needed to learn how to do a website. Now, obviously, everyone doesn't need that vision. They, what's the vision of now? Well, they need to learn how to, um, I don't know, do better customer relationship management, like CRM, or they need to learn how to, they need that they're gonna have to have a virtual reality, you know, a real estate agency needs to know that they're gonna have to create virtual reality experiences of every mm. house they have for sale. That's just an example. Right. Um, you know, stores that have been in a location for 100 years need to learn how to turn their stores into destinations that are more than just about whatever it is, the clothes they're selling or the music they're selling or whatever. You know, Tower Records failed because they, they became, you know, as music got streamed on the internet, Tower Records didn't learn how to become a destination, so they yeah. failed. Bookstores might be going through the same thing. They enter in cafes and they have readings, but they still need to learn how to become destinations. So figure out you know, what business you're in, how it's changing, how you're gonna invest in yourself. Investing in yourself every day, and there's lots of ways to do it, which we could talk about later, but investing in yourself every day is really an important skill. Knowing that you have to invest in yourself every day and knowing that you have to mitigate risk every day. So that's a long way to answer your question. That's an awesome answer though. So then you sold that business for 15 million? Something yeah. like that, yeah, Somewhere 15 in the, million that. cash. And then crash and burn. Yeah, by the way, I'm not bragging because <laughs> two years later, two years later, almost to the day, uh, maybe two and a half years later, I had $143 in my ATM. It was the worst crash and burn ever. I, did not, I stopped <laughs> mitigating risk. I invested in everything. I bought everything. Mm. I gambled. I did everything possible I could to just, I was like a drunken rock star on steroids. Like imagine the worst guy. I, I didn't just trash one hotel room. I trashed like five hotels and had to pay for it all. Literally? No. Oh, I was like, <laughs> but like wow, metaphorically, I don't see you as a <laughs> hotel <laughs> crasher. Maybe one room. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I was so stupid. And it's really like, it's one thing to make it. There's three skills, making it, keeping it, growing it. So I was able to make mm -hmm. it, but I made it in a time which afterwards I saw, oh my God, that was the lottery. It was like the internet boom. Mm. I didn't keep it and I didn't grow it. So I didn't have the two most important skills. Making it, for most people listening, is very hard. And it is very hard. It requires you know, all these things we discussed before and then some. But keeping it is, is even harder. 
let's pause on making it because back in those days when you were you were still working at HBO or maybe right after you left, what was an average day like? Like how hard were you working at that point? Uh, I'd get up at about five, get to HBO around 6.30, uh, start working. So by 10, you know, when you work at a corporate job, no one's going to deny this. I have nothing against corporate jobs or whatever. You really only have to work two or three hours a day. The rest of the day is lunch breaks, <laughs> water breaks, right. meetings. How many meetings do you have in a day? And, I, and, I, and most meetings don't get anything done. It's, it's a waste of like a thousand man hours. So you can get mo the bulk of your work done in a corporate job in like three hours. So by 9.30 or 10, I was done. And I was a software engineer. So uh, if your software works, you have less work to do. So I'd always make sure my software worked and mm. nobody was complaining. So I had no updating to do. And then gra you still have to go to meetings and everything. But gradually, I'd like lock myself in the conference room and I'd start working on websites for other <laughs> people. And then at night, let's say at 5 o'clock, or the workday ends at 4.30, uh, I'd sneak out and go downtown to my work job. And then I'd work like pretty much all night. Now, I don't wow. think that's the best way to do it. Like you, I think sleep is incredibly important. I, so I had to move. I moved from being Queens, which is like 20, you know, 10 miles away, to being right in between. And, uh, I moved to the Chelsea Hotel, which is a building right in between where my work was and uh, HBO, so I could make sure I can get back and forth mm -hmm. really easily. Because sleep's really important. I had to sleep like seven hours a night, and I tried to do it. I didn't always succeed. But then at night, I was just doing all this programming and design and working with my employees. And then finally, I figured out, oh, you know what might be a good idea? Find a better programmer than me. And of course, this is how all business works. Pay him less than I'm getting paid. <laughs> so I get value, and he gets value. So yeah. he, I hired a great programmer who didn't know the internet because it was a new thing then. He, learned, he got to learn the internet and get paid by me. And I was able to focus on getting more clients and, and so on. So, but during the day, sometimes my bosses were always afraid I was interviewing for other jobs because I'd get in a suit <laughs> and I'd go over to JP Morgan and pitch them to do jpmorgan.com or whatever. Gotcha. So I was constantly also trying to get new clients. It was really hard. It's really hard to get customers. You know your business is good when you have a customer. A business is not good unless it's sustainable. And sustainability means customers from day one, as much as you can, um, and profitable. And people think, oh, I need venture money first. Venture money is welfare. Try to avoid welfare if you can. Mm -hmm. Try to get your cheapest money and your easiest money is customers. But it's hard to get a customer. You have to have a good yeah. idea that's sustainable. But that's when you know your idea is good. Customers are, are profitability is the, the filter that tells you you have a good business. Yeah. And uh, that's why I asked that because I think now in the online entrepreneurship world, people are underestimating the amount of work to get to the make it part, you know? Yeah. Um, so, By the way, you don't always have to do that much right, work. Right, right, right. Sometimes you could have a good scalable idea and magic happens. But I think always in the beginning, there's kind of that, that I hate to use the word hustle. So many words are, are overworked now. But there's some kind of grit or grind you have to go yeah. through to just make sure, like, okay, nobody else is doing this idea. That's why it's scary. And you just have to make sure you deliver. I always tell people, over-promise and over-deliver. So if you want X, I'm going to give you X plus Y, and I'm going to deliver X plus Y plus Z. And it's really important to do that because that's how you win a customer for life. Mm -hmm. Also, very important, you have a customer, so you become my customer. I should be in touch with you every day for at least the first 100 days. Because when you become a, cu when you become a customer of me or a customer of anyone, you don't just want the vendor-customer relationship you kind of want a friend. You don't want to just mm. w live life dealing with people you don't like. So part of building a customer relationship is also building a real friendship. And that's, mm. what, that's what life's about, let alone business. Business is just a subset of life. So, hmm. Awesome. Now you, you get it, and then you didn't keep it. <laughs> and right. it was gone. Then uh, again... I was so depressed. Could you imagine? I was like... I cannot imagine. I was broke. I lost everything. But then you worked your way back because you started investing, and yeah. then you started a hedge fund, but then you lost it again, Yeah, right? well, I started, well, the hedge fund was great because I learned how to invest. Like, I learned the hard way how to invest. At first, I was a bad investor, but then, you know, how do you get better at anything? You get a teacher, so I, ha I was working at first for other hedge fund managers who were really great. You read, like, a thousand books, uh, and you talk to other people in the business, and you do it. So you get the experience of how do I get better at something and you try to improve every day. 
Uh, there was one one guy um, who's a famous martial arts coach. I think his name is Frank Roberts. He says you need a plus minus equal. So you need someone better than you to teach you. You need an equal to challenge you, and you need a minus so you could teach. Mm. Um, and so. So that's how I got better at investing. But I didn't really get better at business. So I didn't know how to raise like an enormous amount of money. And I, so I built a moderate sized hedge fund. I made money, I made a living, but it still wasn't enough to say, hey, this is great. I'm gonna do this for the rest of my life. So I started another business, it was called stockpicker.com. It was like almost like at the time, forgive me for saying this, I called it the MySpace for finance because <laughs> MySpace was the big social network. Right. In retrospect, I should have called it the Facebook for finance. Maybe this is why I didn't grow as huge as I could have grown. <laughs> but I created this social network for finance where people could share their portfolios and message board with each other and message each other and do a Q&A with each other. And um, uh, uh, it was great. And I sold that company to the street.com. So do you have any advice for someone who's thinking that they might get to the point where they could sell their business? Because you've done that multiple times. Yeah. So uh, first off, have a good business. You know, I was profitable from day one. So I arranged in advance. I gave away a chunk of my business actually to thestreet.com in the beginning in exchange for them putting ads on every page of my site. Mm. So and, and to, and then I would, I also agreed, I would write four articles a day for them, and each article would link three times to my site. So suddenly I was getting an enormous amount of traffic wow. and getting ads, plus everybody on like Twitter, or Facebook, all these social networks were linking to me, other blogs. I got every blog to review me. So I had this enormous traffic. I mean, we were getting millions of users a month, and I had ads, guaranteed, because they, they had an ad sales team. I didn't have an ad sales team. I had one employee. Right. So I was making... Profit, profitability instantly, and I had millions of users. So, so you had a good. So, and they wanted. I, I said to them, "How about I give you three percent of my business in exchange for this?" And they said, "No, nah, we'll take fifty percent." I said, "Okay, because fifty mm. percent of something is better than <laughs> saying three percent of nothing." So, so of course I agreed to that. M many people are greedy about percentages. You can't do that when you're starting your business. Mm. Get what you can, do what you can, build a business, start it. You'll make money. Um, in terms of selling a business, as soon as we announced the launch of the business, I called AOL, Reuters, Yahoo, Interactive Corp, Forbes, maybe some others, I forget, and thestreet.com, of course, uh, and Google. And I said, okay, we launched. I can't do this myself. I own half the business. Can't do this myself. I want a bigger partner. I want to work for someone else. Buy my half of the business. And so that's how you get kind mm -hmm. of a frenzy going yeah. to buy your app and wow. we were profitable and we were you know every, social networking was hot so we were the social network for finance and eventually the street.com said look you can't we don't want to be half owned by Google or Yahoo right. we will we'll buy your half and so they bought my half they valued it based on profits uh, and it was a good it was a good deal for me and then a year later I was broke okay <laughs> so then I really I know I want to get to how you recovered because that's an awesome he has four tenants that we talk we'll get to but what are warning signs for someone who might be on the way down? I think the biggest warning sign is that you're hanging out with the wrong people. You're hanging out with people who are not so good for you. We have a short life. We really depend, you know, there's, there's like, you know, if you are a drug user, don't hang out with other drug users because you won't get off the drugs. If yeah. you're a drug user and you hang out with sober people, you'll get sober. If you're out of shape, uh, don't hang out with other people who are out of shape. Hang out with people who are always going to the gym. So we, you know, there's that saying where the average of the five people we spend our most time with. So I think the biggest warning sign is you just are constantly involved in toxic situations, either romantic situations or business situations or friendship situations or employee employer situations. Hang out with good people. Now, finally, share about how to recover from that because now you feel like you have true success, right? Would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you can ever say you know, one has true success. I think, you know, happiness is a, an equation. It's, it's, think of it this way, it's reality divided by expectations. So reality, you can't change so much. Like if I weigh a certain weight, I could maybe every week change it a little bit. But expectations, I can change immediately. I can say, well, I'm fine with how I weigh, or I'm fine with the money I have in my bank account, or I'm fine with how my life is going and my relationships. So I can change my expectations to be as low as possible, without being zero, you can't divide by zero. Right. And um, so so my happiness, reality divided by expectations, can go up high really quickly by changing my expectations. But the real things I focus on and I try to improve every day is physical health, 
48 years old, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Um, but physical health just means eating well, sleeping well, nutrition, maybe a little exercise, you know, moving. Um, emotional health, that's the five people I ha spend my time with. Um, investing in my creativity, I make sure I'm creative every single day. It's really important. I try to improve in every possible way and I try to challenge myself creatively. And then solve the ability to every single day solve these difficult gratitude problems. So uh, I'll give you an example. I, my, my daughter's visiting me today and my, I had one of my daughters visiting me all week and I felt bad. I had all these appointments scheduled today that you know, her, her visit coincided with, but the, I'm grateful for the fact that she in the other room gets to see me <laughs> do this and yeah. at work basically. So I you change a difficult situation into a, a, something I'm grateful for. Gotcha. So let's break down a little bit. Do you have any unique health habits like green juices or specific meditation or anything like that? You know, I think people obsess over that kind of stuff, but that's kind of the final 5% of mm. being healthy. Like if you sleep eight, seven or eight hours a day or nine when you can, you know, nine for, for some is too many. Eight seems to be like the average what people need. Five, nobody in the world needs, like except for people with a rare mutation, which is really rare. If anyone tells you they need four or five hours of sleep a night, they're probably lying or it's a very unique case. But seven, eight hours, sometimes nine is, is good. Uh, but in terms of nutrition, we all know what to do. Just don't eat Doritos all day. Don't eat cupcakes <laughs> all day. And it's hard for me. Like, I love cupcakes. So, me too. Uh, uh, you know, but the final thing, oh, should I be paleo? Should I eat plants? Should I do this? Should I do that? That's like the final 5% of like, okay, am I going to live to be age 65 or age 68 and, and with mm. high quality of life? Like, worry about that after you get the kind of basics done. And in terms of, like, exercise, sure, you can go to the gym every day and that'll make get you in great shape, get you all muscle toned. But just try to walk a little more than you usually walk. I mean, I think, what's the statistic? If you walk 15, 20 minutes a day or th three days a week, you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape. Uh, you know, you, you'll maintain. Mm -hmm. And so, again, just make sure you're active. Don't sit in a chair staring at a computer all day. Like, try to walk every 20, 30 minutes or so and uh, be active. Then, for that final 5%, go to the gym and lift weights and jump rope and run in a treadmill. And you'll see those people on the street, they're in great shape. But that doesn't mean they're necessarily healthier than anyone else. They mm -hmm. probably are, but again, that's that final 1% of health. Right. So some of the things you did for health is you gave some things up because you're sober as well. How long has that been for you? Uh, I would say like six or seven years. Awesome. Congrats. It involves being around good people. So that's what really yeah. changed it for me. You, you mentioned to me earlier, I don't know if you've mentioned this before on camera, you've been sober for two years. Uh -huh. What got you sober? What was what was your bottom? Um, I didn't really have a bottom bottom like some people, you know, you hear horrible stories. I was very high functioning and on the outside I had a life that I loved and anyone else would say I loved. So I was I was already writing my first book at that point. I was self-employed. Um, you know, I had a daughter and a husband I loved to death. I had my faith, you know, I wasn't like I hadn't like left all of my spiritual beliefs or anything. Now my health was not good because obviously I was drinking that much. Um, but I realized that it was starting to control me versus me controlling it. There's a great, and the funny thing is I didn't have um, AA or anything like that. There was this blog called tired of drink, thinking about drinking.com. And I was like, well, that kind of sounds like me because I'm tired of thinking about this. That was the thing. It was in my head too much. And I really felt like I believe in God and I felt like he pressed on me and it was kind of a moment where I realized I was not going to achieve what I wanted to achieve and give what I wanted to give to the world if I kept drinking. How much were you drinking every night? Um, well, it wasn't every night. So some people would automatically say, well, then you're not an alcoholic. But in your mind, that's the problem. And so I was looking forward to when I would drink, when the next time would be, how could I, you know, I was thinking about it all the time. But then when I would drink, I mean, it was a lot. <laughs> like what's, was, a, what's a lot like three glasses of wine no way more. like three like bottles of six wine six glasses of wine or eight glasses of wine so that's two bottles of wine by yourself or with with family and friends yeah but i don't watching think TV, you can i don't Dexter. think if you you can't tell people that though i'm gonna have to edit that out no you got to be fearless you can't edit that out oh you think all right let's 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 we'll see i mean like my here. parents know you know like and obviously my closest family and friends know but i don't Oh, that's 
Don't You're making be me all sweaty. You're gonna make that. This will be your most popular podcast when you talk like this. So this right. is good. All right. Even even keeping this part in, you and me talking about you being fearless, you should keep in. I'm telling you. What do you guys think? I don't know. We'll see. You don't know because this isn't live. Thank God. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about the creative fulfillment. I love how you make yourself do 10 ideas a day. You write out, try and write out 10 ideas a day. I'd like for you to talk about how you got into that discipline because a lot of creatives, you know, writers, speakers, uh, designers, photographers that are maybe self-employed, the idea of having that kind of everyday practice is a little daunting, the discipline. So I'd love for you to talk about that and how you, and what happens if you don't reach 10 or do you reach 10 every day? I reach 10 every day, yeah. Awesome. So how'd you get started to make yourself do that? Well, it started a long time ago. I was just, I was broke. This was the first time I got broke and I was like, oh God, how am I going to get out of this? And I just couldn't sit around. I needed, I, and I had no ideas. I had no ideas what to do because what happens is, let's say you get hit by a car and not a bad accident but you have to be in bed for three weeks your legs are got, you're gonna need physical therapy to walk again because that's how fast muscles atrophy your leg muscles will atrophy the idea I call it the idea muscle because it atrophies just as quickly and most of us have atrophied idea muscles I did too and still do on occasion if I don't do this practice and what I found was writing 10 ideas a day and and they don't have to be ideas about what can I do for a business they could be ideas for oh, oh here's 10 ideas Kelsey should have for guests or here's 10 ideas for Amazon to improve their self-publishing or Google to improve their search engine or here's mm -hmm. 10 ideas for how I can help people today there could be all sorts of ideas here's 10 ideas for books I can write um, but usually I start writing them down and by they should, it should be hard enough that by idea number seven, I feel like I'm sweating. Like I, I start counting over and over again. Have I hit 10 yet? Have I hit eight wow. yet? And so I'm, I'm doing it. It takes me about 20, 30 minutes. And then, you know, sometimes I don't do it if I'm writing that day. I try to write every day also. I try to do both every day. Sometimes writing is the equivalent of writing the 10 right. ideas. You know, I try to be creative every day. But once I realized after doing these 10 ideas a day for six months, it was like I had become an idea machine. Hmm. Like you could just parachute me in the desert and I'd figure out how to get like a car and a battery and whatever and <laughs> get out of there. Yeah. Not, not saying that that always works for me, but I found that my ability to come up with ideas in hard situations became much, much better. And that's really what saves you as an entrepreneur, as a parent, as a friend, as a romantic partner. Like having ideas in difficult situations is when you travel, hmm. you know, is really important. Now people say, oh, but ideas are a dime, dime a dozen, executions, everything. They're sort of right. Ideas are hard, I want to say. Like a good idea is very hard. Out of a thousand ideas or three thousand ideas you'll have a year, one might be good. Mm. So ideas are not a dime a dozen. But execution ideas are just a subset of ideas. So when I came up with the idea for stockpicker.com, my next day was, okay, find a firm in India to outsource the drawings to find, you know, here's what the first page looks like, here's what the second page looks like, here's what the third page looks like, here are the people I could call to partner with. I need to come up with 10 execution ideas okay. to get execution going. And they have to be easy and easy to do, but by then I was an idea machine, so my first set of 10 execution ideas were, bam, I had a working business by then. So that's, yeah. that's how it goes. Yeah, that's incredible. I think another thing you asked me about interviewing all these people, most people are resourceful as well. And so what you're saying is you become more resourceful because you're looking Absolutely. for those ideas, which I think is key. Yeah, you so, know who to call. By mm -hmm. then also you've invested in your relationships and your networks, so you know who to call, you know, you know how to act on the ideas and so on. So you've talked a little bit about sort of the law of attraction, not to get too self-helpy, but you know, being grateful and um, focusing on what is abundant in your life, but at the same time you said to have low expectations, which I feel is a contradiction. Can you well, expand on that? I don't really agree with the law of attraction. I don't okay. think I don't think if uh, I want tickets to Mexico City tomorrow, they're gonna just suddenly appear <laughs> in my okay. mailbox. I think the universe just doesn't work that way. And if it does, whatever goodwill I have from the law of attraction, I just gladly donate to anybody else. <laughs> but I do think optimism about what you're doing is important. If you're constantly okay. putting yourself down, if you're constantly saying, I can't do this, if you're constantly saying, um, I'm too old, or um, I'm unhappy, so I can't get up, I, or I have to do this, this, and this today, I can't possibly get this done, I have 
20 kids and I have to cook dinner and I have to clean up and I still want time to watch House of Cards, then that, of course, will attract nothing to you. Yeah. So you have to have optimism and an ability to, you know, just like when I had this job at HBO, I was busy. I had a full-time job and I was, you know, going out with somebody at the time. I had to spend time, I wanted to spend time with her. I had friends, I had interests, I wanted to do those things. But you have to figure out kind of that we all have 24 hours a day to do things. Let's say you spend eight hours sleeping and then another eight hours doing whatever the hell you wanted to do. Now you still have eight hours to like get things done. Hmm. So, you know, making sure you make proper use of your time, again, being healthy so you can do, so you have the energy to do that, being around good people, being creative and making sure the idea muscle is not built so that every idea is get good. It's so that when you need it, you're an idea machine. Yeah. And yeah. again, being grateful so you can move past the blaming and complaining that many people do. It's so easy to get, it's a sand pit to get trapped in that blaming and complaining because you never can get out of it. So before we wrap up, I want to talk to how you transitioned to your wildly successful podcast over what, 12 million downloads I think I read? Do you know um, the stat updated? Maybe, maybe, maybe a little more, yeah. Um, so how did that come about? And, and I have a bunch of podcasts so overall, maybe yeah, like have, 20 yeah. million downloads. Because you have Ask Altucher as well, Yeah, and right? I have Question of the Day with okay, uh, Stephen wow. Dubner from Freakonomics. We do it together. Oh, cool. I didn't realize you were a part of that one. So how, what is your advice for people starting podcasts, wanting to grow podcasts? You know, what have you learned through that? What I've learned, I mean, it takes me out of my comfort zone to call somebody that I don't know, that I'm just, is like a hero of mine, and say, hey, I would love to talk to you, and here are the reasons I why. I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, that's hard. And then, like you said, the preparation, I'll prepare for like weeks before a, for a one hour guest, mm -hmm. uh, and you've gotta do that. You've gotta over promise and over deliver. So reach for the stars on who you're asking, but just just do it. Just do a bunch of interviews and record them with an iPod at first. Like you don't need any fancy equipment, nothing. Just record an interview between you and another person and then ask questions that nobody else would ask. Like mm -hmm. just read everything they've done. I watch other interviews they do and just just devour that person um, beforehand. And so you so when when you get them in the interview, get them off book. So mm -hmm. uh, I interviewed one of my favorite comedians a few weeks ago, and we could have talked the whole time about comedy and his background or whatever. Instead, we talked the whole time about, or most of the time, about depression because how, he was very clinically depressed. And mm -hmm. how do you go from clinical depression to get up there 400 day events a year to do comedy wow. and write comedy and be funny? And how do you translate de depression into comedy and be successful? He's amazingly successful at it. So. It's hard. And so I try to find the hard moments in people's lives and how they overcome that. And it's, it's been very fruitful. I do it selfishly. I do it so I can learn, so I can draw from those people's experiences. And they've become my mentors as a result. And I'm grateful for that. And I, it would be a disservice not to touch on this, I should have asked earlier, about because you're a prolific writer. I mean, you write a ton. And I know a lot of people who watch are writers as well. Can you talk a little bit about your writing process? I know yeah. you write every day, but... Yeah, I write every day, and um, I or just... Or what about maybe choosing what's going to be a book or what's going to be a blog or... Because you've written over 17 books yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So. I mean, if something... I You can tell over time what is resonating with people. So if I post something and I post it on a lot of different places, if it gets no comments and no engagement, I still might love it. Hmm. I might think the writing's good, but maybe people... It doesn't inspire as many people. Um, not that I want to inspire people so much. I write about my own personal experiences mm -hmm. and then I see. Um, people could decide what to do what I do or not. But I see what resonates with people and then if something really resonates a lot, I know I'm onto something and I'll work harder and harder at writing more and more about that topic and turning that into a, a book. So right now gotcha. I'm writing a book on mentorship which should be out in a, in a couple months. And I'm also writing a children's book. Uh, oh, cool. which I'm very excited about. Like it's, I wrote it and it's being illustrated now by a fantastic illustrator. I'm super excited about that. And then um, I just write every day. I mean, I, I, you think of a fun idea and then you just start extrapolating on it. What, do you, what is your number one piece of advice for writers, aspiring or beginning writers? Write every day, read every day. There's no other advice. It's the only thing you can do. Write, read a really good book every day, or not a book, a whole book, but right. read from a good book every day because 
You can only learn from mentors, and the best mentors are the best writers. Don't read a book about writing. Read like a great writer. Mm. And, and, and read from many great writers so you absorb their styles. Because you'll initially absorb someone else's style. Um, and then you have to write every day or else you won't build your own voice. You have to write every day for years. For so years. a long what, time. What are your favorite books off the top of your head? Um, I mean, I have a lot. So it's hard to name like one or two. But there's a collection of short stories by a former drug addict, actually Dennis Johnson. I think he just won the Pulitzer. He's, he's, up, he's always up there for the Pulitzer, the National Book Award. But this is a book, collection of stories he wrote, I think it came out in 1993 or 94, called Jesus' Son, which comes from a Lou Reed lyric. And um, it's a collection of stories that all interweave with each other, and it's so beautiful. I've probably read the book 300 times. Wow. Uh, and then for me, uh, Old Man in the Sea, that book should just be word by word studied because it's so spare in style. Mm. Like, there's not an extra word. Uh, you know, um, I like... Uh, I mean, there's so many. I like The Kite Runner by Khalid Husseini. Yeah, and you have a blog post I'll link of you have a top ten list. That's Yeah, those are mostly nonfiction. I don't like to recommend fiction so much just because everyone has their own taste. Yeah. But on nonfiction, uh, there's a book, Sapiens. There's The Rational Optimist. There's Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb. There's so many great nonfiction books. People should read those, too, because they learn from them. And then you combine a good voice with things you learn, and you have suddenly have something to say. Tell your own story combined with something you've learned, and you have a great story. Um, this is a little bit off topic, but I really wanted to ask you this. So you were talking about your friend, the comedian, and you're a writer, and I'm a creative, and a lot of creatives struggle with some just real internal conflict and end up depressed or end up addicted or end up, you know, Robin Williams, you know, such a legend, and then ends up taking his life. Have you, in your study and all of the reading and interviewing you've done, found some reasons why you think or how creatives can like prepare or protect themselves from that yeah and you, creatives and everybody listening to this will relate creatives have good taste so I read something and I could say oh my gosh that's a great book and I look at my own writing and I say oh it's not as good as what I just read there's a gap and so it's important you get depressed then and then mm. you write something and it doesn't get like people try to say, oh, I don't care. If people like, I'm just doing it for myself. It's not true. If you're if you're a creative, it means you're an entertainer. You mm -hmm. want to entertain people. Mm -hmm. If you want to, you, if you want to help them, that's good too. But at heart, you're not helping them if you're not first entertaining them. Right. And if you're not entertaining them, you feel bad. You feel like, oh, I didn't do as good as I could do. Not like this other guy or woman who I just read, who is just so fantastic. I really wish I could be like that, and that's depressing. Yeah. Or if you don't have something which is as good as that other thing, um, like if you're a painter and you see all these great paintings in a museum, you feel the gap. Or if you're an actor or an actress and you see someone act really well, like you feel the gap between your own ability and that person's. And so on the one hand, it's, it helps you strive to improve, but very important to keep beginner's mind so that you don't always assume, ah, I've achieved it, I'm now great, I'm now a success. You always have to have beginner's mind because there's always going to be a gap between you and the people you admire. So, so again, that's happiness equals reality over expectations. I have to always expect that there's going to be people better than me, that I have much to learn. You know, there's always that saying, you know, the more I learn, the more I realize I have to learn. So uh, that's really the, the key to, to, A, getting depressed and trying to avoid it. Another if you're thing creative. I think is a cause for depression in driven people especially is something that you talked about in the terms of goals as jail jail bars or jail cell. Can you explain that theory? Yeah, like if I have a goal, by the end of the day, I'm going to do like a thousand push-ups or a hundred push-ups, and instead I'm in podcasts all day or I'm writing all day, um, I'm going to just be disappointed in myself, and there's no reason. Life's short. Why would you spend that much time being disappointed in yourself? Most goals we don't achieve. So better to have what I call themes. So a theme is, mm -hmm. I'm just going to try to be healthier today than yesterday. That I could do no matter what. I could drink water. I could eat well. I could move around. You know, I could, I could try to be more creative today than yesterday. I'll work on my children's book or I'll work on some new idea. That I can do. I don't have to finish it. I don't have to have a goal. I don't have to say write 2,000 words or, or you're trash. Um, you know, just live by themes rather than goals. And it's a much better recipe for happiness. And, and not just happiness, but well-being. 
Happiness yeah. comes from goals. Oh, I achieved my goal. I'm happy. But then in the morning you wake up again, you're sad because you have a new goal to achieve. Well-being is I'm constantly improving confidence in something. My friendships are good, and I'm moving towards freedom. None of that has anything to do with goals. It has to do with movement. That's one thing I think you're different than a lot of people I interview because you don't have like a quarterly target, right? No, never. Which I think is so, it's kind of mind-boggling I might be to me. dead in a quarter. <laughs> yeah, but I how do you... I just want today. I want, I'm, not, I'm probably well, not going to die today. What about the podcast? Surely you have, a, you have a production plan. You have, I mean, your business is, you have to be tracking metrics somewhere or else what... You yeah, have. I try to improve. So okay. I try to get better as an interviewer. I try to listen to other interviewers. I try to get good guests. I'm just trying. Gotcha. I'm not saying, oh, if I don't hit like a gazillion downloads, my podcast <laughs> is awful. By the way, if my podcast is awful, I'll stop doing the podcast. I've already been doing it for two and a half years. At some point, I'm huh. going to stop. You can't yeah. do something forever. So that'll learn, the, and that'll give me that'll free up a couple of thousand hours a quarter to yeah. to do something new. So eventually, you, you have to reinvent yourself every couple of years. If you look at like every band, music band. Mm. They kind of had their five-year period of greatness where they wrote great songs, like the Beatles from 63 to 68 wrote great songs. Rolling Stones maybe a little bit longer, but not many bands are longer than five years where they have their period of greatness. And then they constantly have to reinvent. They either re reinvent in solo careers or they reinvent as being great at putting on a show and touring or mm. they uh, reinvent in a completely different career. So reinvention is an important concept in, in any kind of creativity. And I'll tell you, for my own reinvention, I mean, again, I wrote a children's book, which is completely different. I'm taking, uh, I'm starting to do a photograph of the day. I'm a horrible photographer, <laughs> but I'm putting on Instagram a new photograph every day or so with a little bit of a story, and I'm trying to get better. Uh, and in July, I'm starting to take uh, DJ lessons. I don't know anything <laughs> about music. I don't know anything about DJing, awesome. but I want to expand my creative language. And so that's important to do, to expand your creativity and do different things. Wow. That is so cool. Okay, last couple questions. Looking back over your whole journey so far, what's been the best thing and the worst thing? The worst thing is losing all my money <laughs> and getting divorced and having horrible relationships with bad people yeah. and being unhealthy and not being creative and not being grateful and blaming and complaining. So that's easy. Mm -hmm. The best thing is right now I get to sit and talk about it. So I'm talking with you. This is fantastic. I get to ask you a couple of questions. I got to take away from this. And uh, I'm having fun every day. I don't think about what was good yesterday. I'm only, only today is hard enough to worry about. I can't worry about yesterday or tomorrow. I, that is one thing I'm working on and I'm not very good at. And I think a lot of driven entrepreneurial types are not good at being present. That's another common trait with yeah. successful people is that they, they learn how to be present. And I think, look, you have to, again, mitigate risk about the future. You have to learn from the past. But it's all to serve this present moment not for anything else because I could be I could walk out of here and get run over by a car and by the way I don't even mind if that happens because mm. who will who, I won't know <laughs> so <laughs> right um, but I want this to be enjoyable so that's it and what's your number one piece of advice for aspiring or uh, just starting entrepreneurs you know either they're solo entrepreneurs still or maybe they have five or ten employees and they're growing what's your number one piece of advice don't don't worry about getting rich you know, worry about perfecting a craft. So be better at something than everyone else and, and solve something that really annoys other people and be good at, so be the best in the world at solving something that really annoys other people. So I'll give you a great example. Um, I get really annoyed waiting for a cab when it's raining on a Friday night at rush hour. Right. That is the most annoying thing in the world. So someone came along, thankfully, uh, and solve that problem for me, Uber, and that's a great company. Yeah. So solve an annoyance, and then of course, physically, emotionally, creatively, gratefully, just take care of that end of your life. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, Kelsey, We're gonna this be right great. back after this with Fast Facts. Man, there is so much we can learn from that interview, but here are my keys to success from my interview with James Altucher. Number one, reinvent yourself. Don't be afraid to change directions. Altucher changed courses in life multiple times, transferring skills and experiences each time. He says it's important to keep a beginner's mind and keep reinventing yourself. Number two, invest in yourself. 
He says investing in yourself every day is an important skill. He got a mentor. He read books. He studied sales. He went to networking events and pushed himself outside of his comfort zone. This investment in himself paid off, leading to the sale of his first business for close to $15 million. Number three, push yourself. Many entrepreneurs focus on the money, he says, but that's a mistake. Instead, you should push yourself to become the best at a particular craft, especially when it comes to ideas. He pushes himself to come up with 10 new unique ideas every single day and pushed himself outside of his comfort zone. So be sure and push yourself every day. Lastly, choose yourself. Now, Altucher wrote a book called Choose Yourself, talking about creating your own career path, which he has definitely done. But specifically, I mean that you should choose yourself and your internal development over just making money. For example, he chooses to be active each day, he eats well, he sleeps well, he takes time every day for gratitude and personal growth. He says we have a short life and we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. So choose yourself by choosing to spend time with the best people. Okay, we are back with Fast Facts. Are you ready? Yes, I okay, think so. Okay, so just answer as... I'm a little nervous. Oh, it's easy. Like, do I have to answer in one second? Well, just try and answer as quickly as you can and short answers. All right. But it's, you'll see it's easy. What is the wallpaper on your phone? I don't think I have one. I don't... Just like standard? Yeah, nothing. That's disappointing. I don't, you know, the, I don't use my phone really. Like, I, oh. my phone number for anyone who wants to know: two zero three five one two two one six one. Call me anytime, text me anytime. I might answer a text, but I don't answer the phone. I have no I voicemail, know. nothing. It's crazy. Uh, the phone app, the, the is a little used app on my phone. So, <laughs> so do you? Does it alert you? I mean, are people texting you all the time? Yeah, but I, and sometimes I respond. If I'm in a cab and I have time, I respond. Gotcha. Okay. What is the last thing you Googled? The last thing I Googled was a beautiful young lady named Kelsey Humphreys, because I wanted to learn more about <laughs> you before we did this podcast. Gotcha. Scrabble or charades? Scrabble, because I'm not as much a team player. And <laughs> um, key thing for Scrabble, I'll give you advice. Uh, memorize all the two-letter words, not as easy as you think, because K, I, Q, I, and Z, A are legal two-letter words, and Z, Z, X, I is a legal two-letter word, so memorize all the two-letter words, because those are high points. Memorize all the Q without you words, like Q, A, T, Q, O, P, F, yep. Q, I, um, Q, A, N, A, T. Uh, memorize, if you can, the six-letter stems. They're called stems, and if you add any seventh letter to them, uh, you'll most likely get a good legal seven letter word. So S-A-T-I-N-E, satin, is a six letter stem. For instance, E is a legal seven letter word, atesian. X, anti-sex. Uh, Z, zaniest. So, Scrabble. Wow. Charades, I'm not into. I would not want to sit down and play Scrabble with you. I mean, I felt I like play, I was a good player I before. play good one player, two player games I'm good at. Gotcha, you're a chess player too. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, recent book you read? Uh, recent book I read? I'm reading Neil Gaiman's um, Collected Nonfiction, and it's great. I'm really enjoying uh, Right now, I just finished a chapter, his interview with Stephen King, which is great. Oh, Imagine wow. Neil Gaiman, had a king of fantasy, hanging out with the king of horror. It's beautiful. Wow. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla, by far. One by the way, most chocolate contains vanilla. Oh, so Interesting. One word you say too often? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Who is the last person that you called or texted? Uh, probably one of my daughters. Last awkward situation you were in? Probably involving one of my daughters. <laughs> last vacation you took? With my two daughters. Recent, oh. where'd you go? Uh, where'd we go? Where'd we go on our vacation, last vacation? Probably Must Florida. Must have been pretty memorable. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hobby, current hobby? Chess. Uh, coffee or tea? Coffee. Early bird or Although night? Although a friend of mine is trying to convince me to convert to matcha tea. I converted to chai tea. All right. Because my... A lot of dairy in chai tea. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm making it myself. Okay. So I'm not. But uh, during an interview once, my mind went blank, which doesn't happen very often, but it did. And it was with Brendan Burchard, and he said... 
how long ago did you have the caffeine? And I was, it was like a couple hours and he was like, yeah, that's why you just lost your train of thought and you gotta give up the coffee. And I was like, okay, and eventually uh, You know, that's one of those <laughs> things, again, it's like in the final 5% of being healthy, coffee or no coffee, there's research on both sides, who knows? Yeah, well, I and mean, each person is different because I know some people have a high caffeine tolerance versus low caffeine yeah. or something like that. But there's also a lot of antioxidants in coffee, right. but it's also acidic, so who knows? I know. Um, early bird or night owl? Early bird. Winter or summer? Summer. Wine or beer? Zero. Neither. <laughs> Pancakes or waffles? By the way, wine and beer, the taste just sucks. Like, <laughs> wouldn't you rather have a vanilla milkshake than Ooh, wine yes. or beer? Yeah. Like, oh, wine is disgusting. I go to these, I, I've been to like a couple of wine auctions. They all act like they know what they're doing. It all just tastes disgusting to me. People will come in, I'm sure, on this disagreeing with you, but... Uh, pancakes or waffles? That's a hard one. It depends on how they're made. Guilty pleasure TV show? Um, right now I'm watching Lost. Again, really? for the third time. The third time? Yeah. That's commitment. Favorite snack? Uh, I've been going to Juice Press and getting these vanilla protein shakes, and that's great. Mm. Favorite cereal? I don't have one. Favorite music right now? Uh, any rap I like. Rap. And I also like classic rock. I just did a podcast with a guy who wrote about the Rolling Stones. I like the Rolling Stones. Hmm. Uh, biggest pet peeve? Um, I don't really have a pet peeve. What would your daughter say is their biggest pet peeve that you do? Uh, sometimes, for no real apparent reason, I will shout out the word no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll like remember something from tw that happened 20 years ago, and I can't help it. I've been doing this since I was a kid. I'll just shout out the word no for no reason. Oh, but the biggest pet, pet peeve I usually have with a romantic partner is that I drop money all over the floor by accident. Like, I don't carry a wallet, oh, so, so I drop money around. it just goes everywhere? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. What were you doing right before this interview? I was preparing for this interview, right before this interview. And what will you be doing right after this interview? Um, doing another interview. Really? Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks for fitting us in today. This has been so cool. I told you guys he's fascinating. I love talking with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And again, I'm Kelsey Humphreys. Thank you for watching here with James Altucher. And this has been The Pursuit.